The Bible is a book that contains many things. It uh, certainly contains uh, a revelation of God, the nature of God, the, who the Creator is, the source of life. Uh, it tells us about man and mankind's origin. It talks about God's plan for man and the fact that we're not simply accidents, that uh, life is not uh, merely a matter of something that drifts along and has no particular plan or purpose or uh, ultimate outcome to it. The Bible uh, tells us about God. It tells us about mankind. Uh, it tells us about a way of life. It uh, has all sorts of information in there, and somewhat over about one quarter of the Bible is Bible prophecy. Now, there are reasons why that so much of the Scripture contains prophecy. Uh, we think of certain books as being prophetic. Uh, we think certainly uh, of the book of Revelation, of, of that uh, would, would come to mind. That is uh, virtually uh, prophetic in its entirety. Uh, but there are many other prophetic portions of the Bible. Uh, we, we have the books in the Old Testament we call the major prophets. Uh, that's uh, not because they're more important. It's because they're longer, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And much of, of the material contained in those books is prophetic. Uh, the minor prophets, uh, so-called because they're shorter books. Uh, Hosea uh, through Malachi, the twelve minor prophets, are loaded with prophecy. Much of the material contained in them is prophetic. Uh, many other books, uh, such as Daniel, uh, has quite a bit of prophecy in it. And for that matter, there's prophecy scattered throughout the entirety of the Bible. Much of the Psalms is prophetic. Uh, many of the Psalms focus in, uh, prophetic of the time of the Messiah's reign, the time of the world to come. Uh, much of it is prophetic of Jesus Christ, of His ministry. Uh, for that matter, you can start in the book of Genesis and go all the way through and you find prophecy scattered through all of the books of the Bible. Uh, much of what Jesus Christ had to say, much of that was also prophetic. Uh, there's prophecy in Paul's epistles. Uh, there. Paul explains about certain things uh, relating to the end time and certain signs. Uh, there is prophetic material scattered throughout the Bible. And at least one quarter of the Scriptures could clearly be called prophetic. Uh, sometimes you'll read different amounts. Uh, some may say 25%, some may say 30%. Uh, I guess it depends on how you choose to count it, but I think we can safely say uh, that uh, over 25% of the Bible is prophetic. Now, why does God do that? What is the purpose of Bible prophecy? Why is that important? If God uh, sends us a book, and at least one quarter of it contains prophecy, uh, then obviously God considers that pretty important because He took quite a bit of His book and included the subject of prophecy, covered the subject of prophecy. There, there are a couple of reasons that particularly come to mind. There are uh, two things that I would like to call you, to your attention initially in terms of, of the purpose of prophecy, one, things that prophecy does. For one thing, uh, prophecy declares and evidences the sovereignty of God, the greatness, the power of God. Uh, Isaiah lays that out very clearly back in Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, God draws a contrast, inspired the, uh, inspired the prophet Isaiah to draw a contrast between the real God, the creator God, the ruler of heaven and earth, with the idols, the false gods worshipped by the nations. And so in Isaiah 46, verse 1, he talks about Bel bows down, Nebo stoops, their idols uh, were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. Uh, your carriages were heavy laden. They're a beast. They're a burden to the weary beast. They stoop. They bow down together, but they could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. So he talks about these idols and these wagons all loaded down with these heavy idols. And so here you have, uh, you have a cow pulling a, you know, pulling a cart. And this cow is pulling the cart, and uh, uh, it's loaded down with these heavy idols. Now... The idols aren't bearing the burden. The cow's having to carry them. And, and so here this, this thing is, is gradually moving on down. They're all going into captivity. Isaiah is, is painting a picture of the helplessness of the gods that the nations worship. They couldn't bear the burden of the people. They themselves were something that had to be carried and taken places. So 
God then says in verse 5, To whom will you liken me? And make me equal. Compare me that we may be like. Which one of those are you going to compare me to, God says? And uh, they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and they hire a goldsmith and he makes a god and they fall down, yea, they worship. You know, they gather all this stuff, carry it over here to an artisan and he makes them a god. Oh, that's wonderful. We've got something to worship. Now they bow down. What a silly, silly thing. They carry it, they bear him upon their shoulder, they carry him and set him in his place and he stands and from his place shall he not remove. One shall cry unto him, yet he can't answer, nor save, them out of, save him out of his trouble. So God says, you know, they make this little idol, and they set it up over there, and it just stays where they put it. It doesn't move, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't do anything. They bow down, they pray, they cry, they uh, beseech uh, this little piece of metal or wood or plaster or whatever it may be. It doesn't answer. So God says, now... In verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country, yes, I have spoken and I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. So God says, look, I'm God. I declare the end from the beginning. I am able from the very start of things to tell what the results are going to be. God has a plan and a purpose. And so from ancient times, He declares the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand. What God determines will be accomplished. You see, prophecy is evidence of the sovereignty of God. That God rules that when God determines something to be done, it will come to pass. So prophecy is one of the things that demonstrates the reality of the true God and the fact that God rules in the affairs of men. You can go through in the prophecies of the Old Testament, for instance, the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And you read of remarkable things, events that would have seemed very far-fetched. The Bible talks, for instance of cities that would be destroyed. It talks about ancient Tyre, which was a commercial capital for the world at that time. Tyre was located, of course, right on the Mediterranean coast. It was a major city uh, that uh, uh, was a, a major commercial city. And Tyre, uh, the fleets of Tyre, you remember Hiram of Tyre was one that uh, uh, Solomon, uh, he was a friend of King David, and Solomon uh, uh, was uh, able to enlist his help in building the temple. Uh, they, there were tremendous craftsmen that came from that area. And uh, later on, uh, and, and tremendous sailors. And so you read about the fleet that Solomon put together uh, that he financed and was uh, launched from uh, uh, the ports of Israel uh, down in, in uh, Elot, which is, uh, if you look at a map, uh, where the uh, Red Sea uh, comes up, the northernmost uh, point of the Red Sea, uh, called the Gulf of Aqaba, right up at the very point of it, uh, is even today a major Israeli uh, naval port, Elat, and uh, that was Solomon's ancient port. And, and it describes that back in the books of, of uh, First Kings and, and uh, in uh, Second Chronicles. And so you read about uh, this, this navy, and you read uh, about the, the sailors that were enlisted from, from Tyre. Tyre was, for centuries, a major commercial center, a center of, of uh, shipping and trade and commerce, and, and the ships of Tyre went all over the world, and it's detailed even in the days of Solomon, uh, how they uh, went from there and they, they uh, navigated uh, down uh, in various places. Tyre was uh, responsible for the founding the colony of Carthage there on, North, in, on the uh, North African shore. Uh, Carthage was a rival of Rome for, for a period of centuries. And yet, laying this out, and Ezekiel goes through and lays out all of the, uh, the various uh, other nations and, and city-states that were involved in commercial alliance with Tyre, and yet Ezekiel goes on to declare that Tyre would simply cease to be, that it would be scraped like a rock, because it was, there was a, a rocky uh, 
part of the shore there was, was uh, or part of the uh, port uh, as it extended out. And Tyre was actually scraped clean. Right. That's a matter of history. Alexander the Great, writing hundreds of years, uh, or carrying out his actions uh, over 200 years after Ezekiel wrote. Alexander the Great laid a siege around Tyre and absolutely scraped it clean. He actually used uh, uh, part of, of the city, uh, scraped it and, and used it to build a, uh, out going out to this island uh, there off of the right there on the uh, on the coast uh, to absolutely destroy Tyre. Now, God was able to declare the end from the beginning. Here was a major city that was going to cease to exist. Ancient Babylon, the city that Nimrod built, the center of post-flood civilization, and yet uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah are very clear that Babylon would cease to be. Babylon is the ancient city of Babylon is just ruins. It's just a place over there you can go and you can see uh, where there have been certain excavations and, and and they've sort of swept the sand off a little bit, but it's long, long since ceased to be a city. And yet the Bible talks about other cities that would continue on down through time. Jerusalem being one example. Now, if you were living back in in those days, the idea that that Jerusalem would be a focus of uh, a center of events in the end time, which the book of Zechariah and others make, uh, make plain. What are the odds of something like that? A city that has been destroyed and yet rebuilt a city that has been dominated over, trodden down of the Gentiles for centuries, as was prophesied. Uh, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are complete. You see, and it still is, and they're still squabbling over it. You know, Israel has sovereignty uh, right now, but they don't have control, uh, effective control of certain uh, uh, certain areas. The, the most, uh, well, the religious sites there centering around the Temple Mount are governed directly uh, by the, uh, uh, they've allowed the, the uh, Muslim religious authorities uh, to continue uh, there and to control entrance and access into certain parts of it. They've still got problems. The point is, God is sovereign. And there are nations that will endure and there are those that will be wiped away. And God was able to declare the end from the beginning. Prophecy is evidence of the sovereignty of God. That the God we serve is the real God. A God who has a plan and a purpose and the power to bring that plan and purpose about. Now, prophecy not only serves to declare and to reveal the sovereignty of God, prophecy also is there to give hope and encouragement to the people of God. You see, prophecy enables us to make sense of the world in which we live to look around at this world and to see the things that are going on, to see the heartache and the pain, to see the problems, to see all of the things that beset this society. If you didn't know what the answer was, if you didn't know that there was a plan and a purpose and that there is an outcome, it would be a pretty discouraging view. You know, if the best hope you had was trying to get so-and-so elected, maybe if we get him in as president, he'll fix everything. Well... That's a pretty vain and futile hope. You know, we've gotten in. Everybody gets elected, promises to fix everything, right? He's gonna. Everything's gonna be better. It's gonna. It's gonna go to rack and ruin if his opponent's elected. But you get me in there, and everything will be okay. And of course, things go on. Well, the Bible, through Bible prophecy, holds out hope for the people of God. We many of the prophecies were written in times when things were going wrong. The book of Isaiah, a portion of that, was, it was written at a time when Assyria was expanding as an empire. And Assyria had uh, spread its empire all the way across into Asia Minor, down toward, uh, uh, even toward Jerusalem, up to the point of besieging Jerusalem. That story is told in Isaiah. Assyria had taken the northern tribes of Israel into captivity had deported them, was in the process of doing that as Isaiah wrote. You know, things looked pretty bleak on the horizon. It looked like Assyria was going to dominate everything. They were going to control everything. They were taking Israel, northern tribes, into captivity. Uh, They had already taken 
uh, certain of the northern cities of Judah were threatening to capture Judah as well. And yet Isaiah lays out prophecies looking beyond that, holding out hope to the people of God and saying this isn't the end of everything. Showing that God had a plan and a purpose. Looking on beyond, looking to the time when there would come one, the Messiah. Come one from the house of David who Isaiah just spends uh, chapters describing the world that is to come. Describing the one who is called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. The one who will be the Prince of Peace. Isaiah describes that. You see, he not only describes the, the, the calamities of his day, but he holds out hope, the fact that God is going to redeem his people, that the God of heaven is going to triumph, and here's what he's going to do, and here's how it's going to work out, and here's what's going to happen to various of these nations. The nation of Babylon was just beginning to rise during the times that Isaiah was writing, and yet Isaiah foretold its doom, its collapse. Book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote at a time when Babylon was at its height, when Babylon had besieged Judah, and ultimately Judah was completely taken into captivity. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Jeremiah's ministry stretched over a period of several decades. A time when it appeared that everything was going to fall apart. Everything was falling apart. The last king that sat on David's throne was taken captive to Babylon. The, his sons were killed before his eyes, and then he was blinded, and he was led away captive to Babylon. The city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was burned and destroyed. And yet, I, and yet Jeremiah talked about a time that yet 70 years would be accomplished. 70 years. A number of years later, toward the latter part of that, Daniel, who was a captive in Babylon, who had been taken away as a teenager when Jeremiah was on up in years, Daniel describes in his book a time when he was fasting and praying and studying the book of Jeremiah and trying to understand this matter of 70 years that was determined. Daniel talks about that in... Uh, back here in in, uh, the book of Daniel and uh, uh, he describes it uh, in Daniel 9 this is the first year of Darius uh, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans a lot of the historians uh, misunderstand this Darius was a uh, was a royal title and uh, Cyrus was the king or emperor of the empire of the Medes and the Persians was responsible for the conquest of Babylon. But Cyrus himself didn't enter Babylon at that time. Uh, the uh, Babylon was being ruled by Belshazzar. You remember that story in the book of Daniel. But Belshazzar was actually co-regent with his father, uh, Nabonidus, who was elsewhere in the empire with the main Babylonian army. That's why Belshazzar told Daniel uh, that he would make, you know, that if he would would tell him what the handwriting on the wall meant, he would make him third in the kingdom. Well, the reason he said third in the kingdom is because Belshazzar himself was second in the kingdom. His father was the chief king, but his father was elsewhere, and Belshazzar was the one who was actually reigning, ruling in Babylon, uh, and was associated on the throne with his father. Now, Cyrus went elsewhere to fight Nabonidus, and Darius was uh, of the royal seed of the Medes and was actually served as king over the realm of the Chaldeans, ruled that area of Babylon uh, for a couple of years until Cyrus returned. And uh, anyway, notice Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books or by letters the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, you see, this Daniel is writing this within the first year after Babylon had been conquered. Daniel had gone into captivity from the time that the original conquest, Nebuchadnezzar, came in in 604. So a period of 65 years since Nebuchadnezzar's original conquest of Jerusalem has, has taken place. 
Daniel is now an elderly man, on up probably past 80. He's been in Babylon. You see, he came there. He's probably about 80. He came there when he was maybe 14 or 15. Uh, 65 years have passed. So now he's on up about 80 years of age. And he's studying the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10 makes reference if you, you, you want to uh, just be uh, aware of that. In uh, Jeremiah 29:10, it talks about uh, where uh, this is the words of Jeremiah and uh, here, and he talks about the fact that the people are going to be uh, well, Jeremiah 29, 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have car- caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take wives, begat sons and daughters. Now down in verse 10, For thus says the Lord, After seventy years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. So Daniel is here reading the book of Jeremiah, studying the book of Jeremiah, trying to understand what's the starting point. You see, there were a few captives carried in 604. Then there was a much larger number carried in 597 when uh, Nebuchadnezzar put a new king on the throne in Jerusalem and and brought Jerusalem under his uh, personal rule as part of his empire placed uh, Zedekiah on the throne. And then he came back about ten years later and absolutely destroyed the whole place. Now, which of those three dates do you figure from? Well, Daniel is trying to figure this out because here Babylon has now fallen and he is studying and wondering and trying to understand and, and, and wanting to know what all this is about. But God declared the end from the beginning. Before Jerusalem went into captivity, God through Jeremiah said, I'm going to take captive 70 years are going to be accomplished. Well, Daniel was, as he says, uh, he began to understand the word of the Lord that he would accomplish 70 years. Verse 3, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed unto the Lord my God and made, confe- made my confession. Daniel is seeking God, looking to God. You see, in the midst of Babylonian captivity, here God held out hope. God has a plan and a purpose. And then he began to reveal here to Daniel, recorded in Daniel chapter 9, that something that goes beyond 70 years, but seven weeks of 70 years, 70 sevens of years. Actually, the term in Hebrew uh, in uh, Daniel 9.24 for weeks is not the, the normal term for weeks. Uh, it, is, it could most literally be translated sevens. Seventy sevens are determined upon your people. You know, this period of, of years that comes down to the time of the Messiah. You see, God was able to declare the end from the beginning. And He was able to hold out hope to His people. In a time of desolation, in a time of persecution, in a time of trouble, in a time of adversity, what lies beyond right now? Well, the Scripture lays it out. Now, with that in mind... As we look at, uh, let's look briefly at the book in the Bible that is most directly associated with prophecy. The book that represents the, the capstone to the Bible. The book of Revelation. A book that completely corresponds to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. The book of Revelation is just that. It is the book of revealing. Genesis tells you how it all started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes through and it talks about the origin of life on this planet. How God made man in His own image. How God placed Adam and Eve, placed Adam in the garden and then created Eve from Adam. How God introduced His plan and His purpose. We see when we get to Genesis 3, the origin of sin among human beings. And we find then the origin of 
curses, the origin of fear, the origin of death, uh, the origin of all that is painful and difficult in life. It's all revealed right there in Genesis 3. It is the outgrowth of sin. It is the consequence of sin. It is a matter of the effect resulting from the cause. Sin is the cause, and death and pain and sorrow and grief and hard labor and effort, all of those are results. They're consequences. They're laid out in Genesis 3. When you get to Revelation, you read of a time that will be a time beyond sin. A time beyond all of these things. There is a revealing of a time when God will wipe away all tears. There will be no more sorrow nor crying. There will be no more pain. There will be no more curse. You see, the book of Revelation holds out and lays out. And yet, to most people, it is the most mysterious book in the Bible. You can hear every sort of idea imaginable about this book. And yet, if you notice in Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So it is a revelation, an unveiling, a revealing that was initiated by Jesus Christ. God the Father gave it to him. You remember when Jesus was preparing to ascend from the Mount of Olives to ascend into heaven, and the disciples were gathered around him, recorded in Acts chapter 1. Their almost final question for him was, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because Jesus had talked over and over and over again about the kingdom of God. And they said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has reserved unto himself. The Apostle Paul, writing over in, in uh, recorded in, in the book of Acts, uh, where he was there at, uh, in Athens on Mars Hill, and he talked about how God has uh, to to all nations how how that uh, uh, God has determined the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation the things now the things the father had reserved unto himself here is a revelation coming through Jesus Christ that God gave to him the father reserved the times and the seasons unto his own power now he is revealing certain things he is opening it up through Jesus Christ. Christ was the one who is the revelator. The revelation didn't originate with John. Jesus Christ is the revelator, but the Father now makes this available. It is to show the servants of God the things which must shortly come to pass. The things that are going to happen. And those things began to happen from that time on. So some of what John wrote applied directly to the people of his day. Most of it applies on yet future. The majority of it, the majority of this book, yet some portions of it have been fulfilled down, and some of it looks on out to the time a thousand years and more in the future. So it was sent to John. And John, in this book, verse 2, bore a record of the Word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. So John records three things. He bore a record of the Word of God. The term Word of God is a term that refers directly to the Bible, to particularly uh, the Old Testament Scriptures. You know, you go through the prophets of the Old Testament over and over again, and, and they have sort of a standard phrase. The Word of the Lord came unto me, saying... You know, Jeremiah says that. Isaiah says that. Or it's when the word of the Lord came unto me, say, God directly revealed to these men. And they wrote or spoke based on what God directly revealed. John bore record of the word of God. You realize in the book of Revelation, there are over 600 uh, references to the Old Testament. Old Testament scriptures. If you, if you go through, uh, if you have a... a center reference column in your Bible, uh, you can go down through there, and you probably won't have all of those referenced, but uh, if you have a center reference column in your Bible, and you just start going down through there and counting or circling the uh, 
references to uh, the Old Testament scriptures, either quoted or mostly paraphrased. And um, several of the commentators bring out that, uh, that they've come up with at least with over six, well over 600 references. Uh, one, one source that I read, I think the Expositor's Bible commentary, uh, said there were 644. Well, I'm not going to vouch that there are 644 as opposed to 651 or 639, but uh, there's a lot of them. There's well over 600. So John bears record of the Word of God. He quotes, paraphrases, weaves through the book of Revelation, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, brings it in. Now, one of the things that he does in bringing those in, if you just went back and you had the Old Testament, and that was as far as it went, there are a lot of things that you wouldn't know how to fit in a time flow. There are many prophecies. There are many prophecies. Take, take uh, Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 37. The... Uh, in Ezekiel uh, uh, 37, the, the, the Valley of Dry Bones. It talks about a, a general resurrection, a coming to life. Now, when does that occur? Well, if all you had was the book of Ezekiel, you'd know that it would occur, but you, could, you wouldn't know from the book of Ezekiel when it would occur. But as you come on down through the book of Revelation, you come to the point back in Revelation 20 when you read of a time when the dead, small and great, will stand before God. And John lays out in the book of Revelation the order of the resurrections. He talks about the first resurrection and the fact that blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death will have no power. They'll be kings and, pri- they'll be kings and priests. They'll live and reign and rule, never to have to die again. And then John explains in Revelation 20 that after the thousand years were finished, You know, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Well, John explains that. You can't go any other place in the Scripture. You can read about resurrections, but you don't know when. You couldn't put it together. You see, John bears record of the Word of God. He paraphrases and weaves in. To give you by comparison, Paul quoted heavily from the Old Testament, but most of the reference sources would say that uh, uh, they they count about 250 references or so uh, to the Old Testament in Paul's writing. There are over 600 in the book of Revelation alone. The book of Revelation is filled with allusions to the Old Testament. Sometimes just a part of a verse, sometimes a whole verse, uh, sometimes a section. Just over and over. John bears record of the Word of God. And he shows how it fits into the time flow. He also bore record of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we all know what testimony is. You're ask a question and you respond to it. You know, sometimes you're called to... Somebody may be called to testify in court. And uh, they are asked questions and supposedly they have direct personal knowledge of those situations and they're supposed to respond. Jesus Christ gave testimony. He bore record of the... uh, of, of... what the Father had told him. You know, Jesus came. uh, He was prophesied to come as the messenger of the covenant. He came laying out, testifying of the new covenant that was going to be made with Israel and Judah and how people might participate in that. Jeremiah 31 prophesies of that and and, uh, Malachi uh, prophesies of that. Jesus Christ came proclaiming that. He gave testimony in response about the kingdom of God and revealed and made plain all sorts of things about the kingdom of God. In Matthew 24, along with the parallel accounts in Mark 13 and Luke 21, Jesus Christ gave direct testimony in response to a question the disciples asked. They said, tell us, when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They ask a question, and Jesus Christ then began to go through and answer that question. Much, in many places in the book of Revelation, you have direct first-person quotation from Jesus Christ Himself. 
John bore record of the testimony of Jesus Christ. John was there on the Mount of Olives. was one of the little groups standing around Jesus when he heard him respond to the question of what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. John bore record of that testimony here in this book. He bore direct record of what Jesus Christ said, both of from the Old Testament Scriptures and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all the things that he saw. You know, John, uh, uh, you and I re- get to read the book. John saw the movie. Uh, you know, he was he saw in vision. He saw these things. And he wrote down what he saw. And he described. You know, he tried to describe what he saw in the language available to him. If you or I were to see something that we had never seen before. We were to see some great fantastic weapon, some sort of futuristic thing. How would you describe it? Well, you would use the language available to you. You know, it's like when people saw the first automobiles. What did they call it? A horseless carriage. That was, that was, what, it looked, that was what it looked like, you know. And in most cases, that's what it was. It was a carriage that they, they, they had attached a motor to. It didn't have a horse. John described, you know, he saw certain things and it was sort of like a locust and it looked like this and it looked like that. And Well, you know, John never seen an Apache attack helicopter and uh, didn't have a word for that. So he described what these things looked like. He he described, bore record of the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So notice now, he begins the direct introduction to the letter. uh, uh, This was sort of the preface. He's telling us the origin of the book. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten or the firstborn from the dead the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now notice, let's look right here. starts out, this is from him which is, which was, and which is to come. If you go back to the book of Exodus, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and... He told Moses that he had a commission for him. He had a job. He wanted him to go back to Egypt and to deliver his people. And Moses was a little dubious about this. He said, well, you know, I've been gone from Egypt 40 years. I show up back there. And I say, you know, the God of your, the God has said that I'm supposed to deliver you, bring you out. Why would the people believe me? You know, they're going to ask a lot of things. They're going to say, uh, what's his name? You know, the Egyptians worshipped a lot of gods. And God revealed himself to Moses under the name, as described here in Exodus uh, Exodus 3.14. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Now, the term uh, that is rendered in the Old Testament that uh, uh, as a name of God, sometimes you see it spelled out in the, Eng- in the English letters Y-H-V-H, uh, because in uh, uh, Hebrew they didn't use the, 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 uh, uh, the vowels weren't written in, just normally the consonants, and uh, you can find different ones that have different arguments about how the name uh, ought to be pronounced, but Yahweh or Yahweh or something along that line, it derives, we know what the meaning of it is. And this is something, by the way, that uh, I'd call your attention to. It is the meaning of the name that is significant, not the phonetic sound. You know, the phonetic sound had meaning to the people who spoke that language. In Hebrew, this term YHVH, Yahweh, comes from the comes from a conjugation of the the verb to be, and uh, that that uh, it means literally uh, the one who is. 
the one who is and was and shall be. Now that's exactly the way it's translated right here in John in Revelation one four. The one who is, was, and which is to come. This phrase is used elsewhere. You see, what was significant about the sacred name was the meaning that it conveyed. It was the eternal. That's the way that uh, uh, some translations render the name in, in the Old Testament as a translation. Uh, Mr. Armstrong preferred that translation because it, uh, uh, it, it conveyed the, the meaning of the term. The one who is eternal, who, is, who was, is, and shall be. So, he says, uh, grace and peace from the one which is and was and shall be, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Now, what does that mean? What are the seven spirits before God's throne? Do you know God had seven spirits before his throne? Well, you, you know, let's, let's just look here a little bit and, uh, and put it together. Uh, back in Revelation 4, in Revelation 4, John is sees a door open in heaven, Revelation 4.1. And he's told to come up. And when he, he, he comes up there in, uh, in vision, and he sees, he's transported, as it were. And he sees all these things that are taking place. He sees the throne. And verse 5 of Revelation 4, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And... Uh, uh, so we find this, uh, you know, back in the in the uh, book of Hebrews, talking here in, in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, chapter one, in verse seven, it says of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. Uh, an angel means a messenger. Uh, minister in that sense uh, here in Revelation, uh, as it's used in Hebrews 1, uh, simply means a, a servant. Now, here God has these, uh, uh, this that, that look like seven lamps uh, sitting there and burning. Now, back in the book of Zechariah, a little more detail is added in. And uh, back here in Zechariah chapter, uh, chapter 3, Describes Joshua the high priest in Zechariah three nine says, "Behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day." So he talks about seven eyes. Now, if you just come on over uh, a few, uh, uh, on over in the in the next uh, uh, chapter, chapter four, in verse ten, shall. Re- they are the eyes of the eternal which run to and fro through the whole earth. Now, it describes in Revelation 4, as we said, uh, the, uh, uh, these lamps of fire described as seven, uh, as, uh, seven uh, spirits, which are described back in, in uh, uh, elsewhere, you see, as like the eyes of the Lord. Now, you and I can't uh, uh, fully grasp exactly how all of this works, but you know, have you ever wondered how God keeps up with what, with everything that's going on all over the place at the same time? Well, it describes here that He has seven, uh, these seven spirits, seven uh, what God composes and all of the things that He created in heaven are made of spirit. Uh, these seven spirits, these seven messengers look like seven lamps of fire when John saw it. And they're compared to the eyes of the Lord. They're the means by which God keeps up with everything that's going on everywhere. So, John describes in Revelation that uh, from Him which is and was and is to come, Revelation 1.4, and from the seven spirits that are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.4, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, he loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Verse 7, Behold, He comes with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of Him. Now, it's interesting uh, here, because again, if you go back to the book of Zechariah, this time over in the latter part of the book, 
And uh, it describes uh, here what uh, what God will uh, what God will do uh, here in, in uh, Zechariah chapter twelve and verse ten. Uh, verse 9, Zechariah 10, ver, uh, 12, verse 9. It will come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of great grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, it describes in Zechariah 12, verse 10, the nation of the Jews coming to repentance. Coming to repentance when Jesus Christ returns to save them from the destruction. The city has fallen. It's been taken captive. That's described in Zechariah. And then he says, They shall look on him whom they've pierced, which is a reference to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. What did they do with him? Well, they rejected Him as the Messiah. They crucified Him. They're going to ultimately look on Him whom they pierced. They're going to realize who has come back to rescue them and to save them. And they're going to repent very deeply, mourn bitterly, as it says. Well, when John, here in Revelation 1, describes Jesus Christ, he describes Him as one who will come with clouds. Now, you remember in Acts 1, Jesus Christ, when He was received up from the Mount of Olives, He was received up into the clouds. The clouds received Him out of their sight, and, and they stood there, you know, gaping and gawking. And He just, you know, disappeared. The clouds received Him out of their sight, couldn't see Him anymore. And the angel that appeared to them said, Why, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus shall so come again as you've seen Him go. He's going to come back just like he's going to come back just like he went up. Well, he went up in the clouds, and so John says he's going to come with clouds. Every eye will see it. It's not going to be some secret coming. He's going to be seen. He's going to be made manifest. Ultimately, though they which pierced him, everyone. Now, here Christ begins to. Reveal, verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. So again, identifying Jesus Christ as the one who eternally exists, who is, was, and shall be. You know, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8, it talks about Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's another way of saying the eternal. The one who eternally exists. You see, the one who is, was, and shall be. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ has remained constant. Does remain constant. He reveals Himself here under the names Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Then John interprets that. The beginning and the end. The start and the finish. The the, the eternal. The one which is and was and is to come. So, I think it's important that we understand that one of the, that the thing that is most significant about a name is the meaning of the name. When God made His revelation in the Hebrew language, He revealed Himself by names in Hebrew. Now He makes His revelation. John is writing in Greek. He's writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which are, were Greek-speaking uh, colonies in, in the uh, eastern or the, the western area of what is today modern-day Turkey. They spoke Greek. And John is writing to them, and he translates the, the meaning, the concepts that were revealed in the Hebrew Bible. He translates those so that they could understand. So he, John goes on to say, verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle which is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, because of his faithfulness to the Bible, his faithfulness to the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, he was in exile. And various uh, historians talk about the... the uh, uh, time that, that uh, exile, which was in the reign of the Emperor Domitian uh, in the uh, around 90 A.D. John says he was. He says, "I'm your companion in tribulation. 
I go through the trials, the pressures, the difficulties, and also your companion in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So we share the good times and the bad times. John was in the Spirit. He was in a vision in described verse uh, 10, in the day of the Lord, on the Lord's day or the day of the Lord, uh, as uh, the, the, if you go back to uh, the book of Joel and to other places, there are many prophecies that talk about uh, the day of the Lord or the Lord's day. That uh, difference, we make a difference in English uh, in the way we make the possessive, we make it both ways, you know, the Lord's Day and Day of the Lord. Uh, uh, many other languages don't make that distinction. Um, it uh, is a the time of God's intervention. And so, John was, in effect, translated into the future in a vision. Then he heard a voice, heard a great sound like a trumpet, and a voice that said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And I looked, I turned, verse 12, to see the voice that spoke. And when I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, seven lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands was one like unto the Son of Man. John recognized him, and yet he looked different. He described him here, that his head and his hair was white like snow, white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass uh, burnish, uh, burning in a, in a furnace. His voice was as the sound of many waters. His countenance was like the sun shining in its full strength. And again, John just collapsed before him and he said, "I Don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Verse 19, write the things which you've seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Then he begins to interpret some of these symbols, the uh, uh, stars and the lamps. You see, Jesus Christ is revealing this to John. Chapters 2 and 3 go through the direct revelation to the churches. And then in chapter 4, a door is opened in heaven, and he hears a voice saying, Come up here, and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. I'll show you. On beyond, So John, in, in Revelation 2 and 3, recorded a message to the seven churches, seven literal congregations in Asia Minor, that typified the church down through time. They were represented by the seven lampstands. Christ was in the midst. It symbolized the symbolic of the whole church. Well, John describes this vision of heaven and the throne, uh, seeing the throne of God. You can go back to Ezekiel and read a similar description. And he sees these 24 elders... These beings, spirit, uh, angelic spirit beings that uh, represent the, let's say, the highest ranking of the various angelic orders, beings that are responsible to uh, guide and to manage uh, other angels sitting here on uh, thrones around about the throne of God. And it describes them, describes this, uh, what appeared to John to be like seven uh, uh, lamps that, uh, as we've already seen, are like the eyes of God. Then he describes these creatures, these living creatures, uh, that uh, Ezekiel had also described back in Ezekiel 1. And again, they're praising God in the verse 8, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. You see, that concept of the eternal, the ever-living. In chapter 5, John saw that the one on the throne had a book in his hand, and it was sealed with seven seals. And the question was asked, who is worthy to open the book? Now, when a book, when, when a, something was sealed, it was for, it, it was the seal authenticates genuineness. When a king sent an official document, uh, it was sealed with his signet ring. You know, they would close it up, generally it was scrolls we're talking about, they would uh, pour hot wax uh, there where the edges came together. And the wax, of course, would very quickly cool. And as it, uh, uh, as it was cooling and had begun to uh, 
have begun to harden a little bit. The king had a signet ring that had a special, uh, had his special seal. There was only one that existed. It was his. And he would take it and press that signet ring into the warm wax. And it would make the impression of the king's seal. And then the document was transported to whichever official uh, that it went to, the one who was authorized to open it. You see, if you could reseal the wax, you, if you could open the document, you know, if somebody was going to open it and read it, well, they couldn't put the, the impression of the seal back in there. It would be very obvious that the seal had been broken. And uh, so that was the way kings ensured that only the one authorized was going to read it. Here is a document that the one on the throne had who was authorized to break the seal. Well, we find that it was the uh, it was none other than the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the uh, Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, and He is the one who is authorized to do it. And uh, it describes here uh, again in the latter part of verse six the the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So He came and He took the book and. Now we find that all in heaven, all the various angelic creatures uh, bow before Jesus Christ, who is authorized to open the the book. Chapter 6 tells us that he began to open the seals. He opened them one at a time, so we know the seals are consecutive. The first four are described as riders on on a horse. Rider on a white horse, rider on a red horse, rider on a black horse, and a rider on a pale horse. Now, Jesus Christ, back in Matthew 24, had described what was going to happen in response to the question of what will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age. The first thing Jesus Christ said, first thing He warned about, was beware of false prophets. Many will come in My name, saying I'm Christ, will deceive many. Well, here we find the first thing mentioned is the white horse. You know, white is the symbol of Christ. It's a symbol of righteousness and purity. Jesus Christ is pictured in Revelation 19 as coming on a white horse. Well, here is not the coming of Christ. Here is one coming masquerading as Christ. You know, in in the book of 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, uh, writing about the end time, says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Verse 1, Of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You know perfectly the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now, verse 4, You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So he talks about the return of Jesus Christ. Now, on over in Second Thessalonians, he continues in uh, uh, chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians. He said, uh, I beseech you, Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Verse 3, let no man deceive you. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction, the one who is to be destroyed, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped. He shows himself that he is God. Verse 4, Paul said, don't you remember I explained these things to you when I was with you? Now, there's something, verse 6, that's still holding back. Something that withholds it. It might be revealed in its time. The mystery of iniquity is already at work. The system that is going to produce this final false prophet is already at work. But that which restrains will continue to restrain until it's taken out of the way. And then, verse 8, shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan will all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, Christ talked about in Matthew 24 about false miracles that would be so impressive that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. Revelation 13 talks about great miracles to be be worked that will deceive people that dwell on the face of the earth. You see, 2 Thessalonians talks about a great false religious leader who is going to claim to be God incarnate. Paul explained in 2 Thessalonians that that day won't come unless there are two things that have to happen first. One, a departure from the truth, a great falling away, and secondly, 
that final man of sin. Now, there have been a lot of men of sin. There have been a lot of men uh, who have been anti-Christ, who have stood for the very antithesis of, Je- of what Jesus Christ taught. There have been various individuals who have promoted the way of sin. But this is that final man of sin, the one that will be destroyed by Christ that is coming. Well, Christ hasn't come back yet, so that one hasn't been destroyed yet. What we find is you put Second Thessalonians together with Matthew 24, with Revelation 6. The starting point of the end-time countdown is the revelation of that final great false prophet. That individual who will be manifest. And that is the starting point, this white horse. Now, there have been, in a sense, there have been, certainly there have been false prophets that have gone out, but there is to arise this final false prophet. And as Paul explained it in Second Thessalonians, uh, that day won't come except first that man of sin will be revealed, the one who's working is after the power of Satan, the one who will exalt himself above all that is called God, the one that Jesus Christ will destroy at his return. One of the things to watch, in turn, we can look and you see wars and you see famines, you see all these things. But the sequence, the opening of the seals is in sequence. And the first seal is the white horse, the rider on the white horse. He has a bow, the symbol of Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Jesus Christ returns with a sword, the sword, the word of God in his hand, going out from his mouth. This individual, this final false prophet, the, the sequence begins here, the opening of the seals with the manifestation of this final false prophet. And then we find the red horse comes out, has power to take peace from the earth. Again, Matthew 24 makes it plain. You know, after false prophets come wars and rumors of wars. And then uh, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then it describes the rider on the black horse, famine. describes the pestilence, the disease. The fifth seal is open. Symbolic of a future martyrdom time of tribulation on the people of God. Again, when you go through Revelation 6 together with Matthew 24, the sequence is plain. And the false religious leader, this great uh, indiv- impressive individual, is going to appear on the world scene prior to these things, prior to the uh, tribulation, because he, this is the first seal. Now, some of the seals may be open fairly close together. But there is a revealing of an order of events that is made plain here in the book of Revelation. There's nowhere else you can go to get that sequence. It comes down through the first six seals that are opened, described in Revelation 6. The sixth seal is the heavenly signs. And this sets the stage, verse uh, Revelation 6.17, that the great day of His wrath has come. Now it's time for God to intervene. Chapter 7 is an inset. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners, holding back the four winds. Because God is preparing to intervene, but before He does, here are individuals who are going to be sealed, set apart, protected from the plagues of the day of the Lord. Described as a first fruits. Individuals who, have, who are sealed, you know, this is a future sealing. Some people, you know, look around and wonder uh, about the, this 144,000. Well, it's very plain in, in the in the sequence that Revelation chapter seven comes after the first six seals have been opened, prior to the opening of the seventh seal, which is in Revelation eight verse one. The sealing of the 144,000 is in the future. They're individuals who will be protected from the plagues of the day of the Lord. John draws the contrast, or is describes here the contrast in the first half of, of chapter 7 with these individuals who are sealed. Um, and then afterward, verse 9, he saw a vision on beyond in the future uh, that saw the great multitude standing before God, uh, standing before the throne. Uh, he sees the salvation, ultimately the great uh, number of, of people who are a part of who are ultimately in the family of God. So the contrast between the starting and the conclusion is brought out here. Chapter 8 opens the, the seventh seal. 
and we find that the seventh seal consists of seven trumpets. Revelation 8, verse 2. And these trumpets began to sound, and God, these represent God's intervention, the destruction of various things, as God begins to deal with this world in rebellion against Him. And it goes down through chapters 8 and 9, describing uh, the opening of these uh, of these seals, or rather the blowing of the trumpets. This is the after the, the seventh seal is the uh, the blowing of the trumpets, and so we come down through the uh, the blowing of these trumpets, and the fifth trumpet is sounded in chapter nine, verse one, and the sixth trumpet uh, here beginning in verse uh, verse fourteen. Then, as we come on down, we find sort of insets to tell us what's going on. You see, as you're telling a story, you go through the sequence of the story, but sometimes you have to go back and pick up threads to, to bring you up. Uh, chapter 11 talks about two witnesses uh, that are prophesying during this three and a half year period in Jerusalem and the power that God gives them. Uh, then uh, it describes that. And, and uh, uh, chapter 12 describes uh, the story of the church and how that they are uh, protected by God, nourished, chapter 12, verse 14, uh, for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent, protected of this same period, this period of, of uh, tribulation, uh, this period of, of adversity. And chapter, we read about the seventh angel, the seventh sounding that... Uh, is described in chapter 11 and verse 15. Uh, we begin to pick up the sequence again uh, as chapter 11 runs through the uh, runs through the story of the, of the two witnesses. You know, chapter 13 then goes back and picks up the story of the beast, going back, quoting from Daniel and showing here uh, the beast and and the pressure that is brought to bear for people to accept uh, that system. Uh, to re- accept the name of the beast, the mark of the beast in their foreheads. Chapter 13, verse 16, which is the sign of disobedience. It is a sign to, that distinguishes those in rebellion against the law of God from those obedient to the law of God. You know, the wrath of God is poured out upon the children of disobedience. Uh, the, the mark of the beast is the antithesis of the sign of God. It is a sign of disobedience or mark of disobedience as opposed to a sign of obedience, of obeying God. Chapter 14 provides a a contrast. See, chapter 13 opens up with with those who have accepted the mark of the beast in their forehead. Chapter 14 opens with those who have the Father's name written in their foreheads. Those who have surrendered to God, who walk with God, uh, who are picks up the story, you see, of this group of 144,000 we saw back in in chapter 7. Here it looks at them later on down. It looks at them, uh, chapter 7 looked at them before the wrath of God was poured out. Chapter 14 looks at them after the wrath of God has been poured out and is in the process of being poured out. And now they're standing with Christ on Mount Zion, which was the seat of government. This is picture after his return. Over and over we see that the saints are described in verse 12 is those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, who obey the whole Bible, keep God's commandments and have Christ's testimony. It describes here the punishments being poured out on in chapter 15 and 16, and chapter 14 and 15 and 16. Chapter 17 goes back and describes the, is going to describe the judgment on this great religious system called the great whore, uh, here in Revelation 1 or 17, 1, and it describes, picks up the story from Revelation 13 and describes the beast that is ruled over and dominated by this religious system. Chapter 18 describes the, the judgment on the city and describes it in the context of, of a commercial, economic powerhouse. See, there are several aspects. It is religious, it is military and political, it is economic. It involves... Uh, this whole system. Chapter 19 is descriptive of the... It talks about the marriage supper in chapter 19 in verse 9. 
those who are called to the marriage supper. And chapter 20 then picks up the story here at the return of Christ, talks about the binding of Satan, the rule of the saints for a thousand years, the white throne judgment. Chapter 21 then is beyond that, the new heavens and the new earth, concluding here in Revelation 22 with the final vision. And we're told in Revelation 22:14. Or 22.12, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, just the way he opened the book. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, the Bible starts out in Genesis with the tree of life. And it ends up in the book of Revelation with the tree of life. It ends up Again, with the emphasis on obedience to God. Revelation is a revealing. It's an unveiling. It lays out the plan of how God is going to systematically bring about the establishment of His kingdom and ultimately the salvation of human beings. It lays out what's going to happen in the years ahead of us. We've just looked at sort of a bird's eye view of some parts of it. But it is important as we go through and as we understand, we, we have an outline. And everything ultimately will fit into that outline. Jesus Christ revealed the future. He made knowable to the servants of God, demonstrating both God's sovereignty and power in bringing about what He purposes and holding out hope to the people of God for the ultimate destiny in which we can share. 